Saul back to Jerusalem. Fear was happening. The risks involve change as new people are included, but there is often fear associated with that change. The fears we have are similar to that in this first church when Saul went to Jerusalem. Fear led to these three issues that were found within the church in Jerusalem. The disciples distrusted. There was a developing dispute which led to distancing. Have you ever seen that happen within the context of a, of a community? I'm here to tell you, we're no different than the first century church. It's thankful and I'm so grateful that the Lord has solutions for these issues, don't you? Aren't you glad that God has some solutions? We're going to be looking into these solutions. One, we're going to recognize where they came from, these problems came from, the growing pains. And then we're going to look at the solutions that God illustrates within the context of this narrative. The solutions are encouragement, preaching the name of the Lord, and the relationship of brothers and sisters. But let's take a look first at this distrust. Scripture says, and they were all afraid of him, Saul, and they did not believe that he was a disciple. Can you imagine where their fear might be coming from? Wasn't that the guy just three years ago? Three years ago, he was trying to kill us all. We were hiding because of him. I don't know. I don't know if I trust him. I'll tell you what. If he shows up, we'll get our deacons to keep an eyeball on him. And we'll make sure that he stays in the right place and he's just there. We'll make sure. We'll keep an eye on him. All of these things that meant that they would have to be able to protect themselves were taken in, in stride. And they were thinking to themselves, all right, if he's going to come, we're going to have to take protection. We're going to have to be cautious. They were afraid of him. And they did not believe that he was a disciple. I'm going to let you know that the solution to distrust is found within people who are willing to be Barnabas. When you see distrust happening within your community, you need a Barnabas. Don't you? Because look at what Barnabas did. Barnabas took Saul and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had, Saul had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Can you see this happening within the context of a, of a community of faith? You've got Barnabas who took Saul and said, listen, guys, I know him. Now, let me just remind you who Barnabas is. Barnabas is the guy that sold his field and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas is that guy. Barnabas is the known as the encourager. In fact, the disciples called him Barnabas because his real name is Joseph. But he was such an encourager, they gave him the name Barnabas. Barnabas is the one who's taking Saul and saying, hey, listen, I know that you're afraid, but I've heard his story, and I know him, and I believe him, and I want you to believe him, too. I want you to know that he knows the Lord just like me. He validated his story. It's important to have Barnabases in your congregation, isn't it? it? Because it's the way in which those who are on the outside start making it to the inside. Now, I'm just going to let you know, if the population that fits into this building is 200, and as I look upon those who are here, we're, we have probably around 52. I don't know, roughly 
probably around 50 in attendance today. That means that we need how many Barnabases to fill the church? We need at least 50 Barnabases to begin, but that's only going to get us halfway to the filling of the church, right? Because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Don't you want to be a Barnabas? I'm going to let you know, in, when I'm reading through this story, Saul's not the hero. Now, that's hard for me to say because I read Saul and I read, you know, all of his writings with the scripture. But in this context, Saul's not the hero. It's Barnabas that's the hero. He took him and brought him and validated his story to the disciples. These stages of distrust will really mess with um, the way in which a congregation can grow. Someone put this together. And it was, um, it, it listed out these stages. <laughs> doubt is one, begins with doubt. Suspicion is the next. Anxiety, fear, self-protection. These are the levels of, of doubt, I'm sorry, of distrust that builds. And you can imagine getting into self-protection. There's pretty much nothing that you can get, you know, you can't come back from when somebody is protecting themselves. Because if you put on that armor of self-protection, you got to take the armor off before you are able to receive a relationship in this context. Isn't that right? Somebody has to take the armor off because the relationship is not going to move forward with the armor staying on. Barnabas is capable of interrupting each of these stages. Here's some quick tips to become a Barnabas. Now, I, re I realize that it's small uh, print, but I wanted them all to be on one page. So I'm just going to read them. If you can't see them, rest your eyes. I'll read them to you. Number one, always find something to compliment about someone when you talk to them. Look for compliments. That's what Barnabas would do. Always look to the positive perspectives when you look, uh, when you talk to someone. In other words, don't be a negative I don't want to put a name in there. <laughs> don't, don't be a negative. Is anyone named Norman here? Okay, don't be a negative Norman. Look for the positive. And if you didn't speak up and your name is Norman in this room, I'd be terribly sorry. <laughs> Always smile when you are with people. Always be fully present and engaged when you talk to someone. Don't you hate it when you're talking to someone, you're, you're really enjoying that company time, and then somebody gets, that other person gets a text message, and then all of a sudden the conversation is over. Have you ever noticed that? It's like the problems of modern society that interrupt genuine relationship is consumed by other relationships that aren't necessarily important at that moment of time. But you think that it is, because your phone is buzzing. You think that it's important, but you rob the moment with somebody there live. So my, here, if you don't take anything else, just do this. If somebody, if you're talking to somebody, just, you know, take the message after you're done talking. See, be present. Be present when you're talking to someone. Always focus on the other person's topic, not just your own. Always give people hope when, they, when you talk to them. Don't you know that Adventists, we're supposed to have a whole lot of hope, right? Yeah. Right? I know, I know. And he's coming again. He, he's coming to take us home. We, you know, I had to get this, right? So I, I can go pastorally complaining. You know, people, when you can get into that rut where you start to complain. Well, I, I, I can do that too. I was driving down the street with another pastor friend of mine, and I was... I was just like, you know, all uptight about something, you know, the conference should be doing this, and people should be doing this, and, and he kind of nods his head, and he says, you know, you're worried about a lot of things, but, you know, there are things that we can't be happy about, you know, um, there are, in the world, there are children that are dealing with cancer, you know, it puts it in perspective, and forces me to start considering the hope that we have as Christians in Jesus Christ. 
Be that kind of a person. Always affirm people's strengths when you talk to them. Always praise people for something that they've done in the past. Always give people the benefit of the doubt in your conversation. And always let people know you are grateful for them. Now, I'm just going to let you know, I'll say it right now. I'm going to intend to be a Barnabas for, for, you know, for everyone here. And so I'm very grateful for you. I, I truly am. I'm very grateful. You know, it's, it's, it's a team it's a team effort, it's a family, and I'm very grateful for you. So if you're interested in being a Barnabas, okay, if you're interested in that, just wave your hand. If you're not interested, you don't have to wave your hand. Everybody's just going to look at you funny. <laughs> so um, this is what happened as a result of Barnabas overcoming the distrust. Saul went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Now that's, that's fantastic. He starts finding his place within this community where he's able to go in and out. I've preached before in the past, you know you are fully accepted in the family. This is how I know that I'm fully accepted in the family. I've even told my my future daughter-in-law. This is how you know you're fully accepted in the family is when you feel comfortable going into the refrigerator. <laughs> That's how you know. When you can go into somebody's house and go into their refrigerator and take anything you want, you know you're part of the family. Here's Saul and he's going into the Jerusalem church and he's eating anything he wants because he's been accepted as part of the family. And he starts preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Here's the problem. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you that even Saul had a problem allowing himself to be fully engaged in this growing pain time. Because he spoke and disputed against the Greek-speaking Jews to the point where they wanted to kill him. I started looking at this and I started to compare it with the difference between speaking, you know, preaching in the name of the Lord and disputing. There is a difference, you know. When you preach in the name of the Lord, it leads to grace. When you are disputing with the Hellenists, it leads to being different with one another, the difference. When you are preaching in the name of the Lord, Jesus gets uplifted. When you're disputing with the Hellenists, you pretty much uplift yourself because, let's face it, the argument, you need to defend what you are trying to say against what they're trying to say. When you are preaching in the name of the Lord, it develops inclusivity. Now, Saul should have learned this, especially having come you know, in that, in that relationship with Barnabas, that inclusivity was allowed to him. But when you're disputing with the Hellenists, it, it develops segregation to the point where they wanted to kill him. They didn't even want to just get rid of him. They wanted to end his life. The moment your point of view becomes more important than the people you were talking to, is the moment you've lost your ability to minister to them. Does that make sense? And so as new people come, obviously, I want to share all the wisdom that I have. And I, I, I want to say that I have a lot, but you, you all say that too, don't you? We all want to share all the wisdom that we have. But what happens when it starts to be conflicted with what their wisdom is. If I was to go over to Sherry and say, say, I think peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are the best sandwiches in the world. And Sherry responds by saying, uh-uh, you haven't had a good sandwich if you think that. The best sandwich is tomato and lettuce and, and that bird yeast. That's the best sandwich. And I would say, uh-uh. And all of a sudden, this sandwich argument starts to break down our relationship with one another. And my whole point of trying to grow in her relationship is to convince her that she's wrong. If 
vice versa. Do you see how disputing doesn't build the church? It's because all it does is pushes for your own agenda. And we can get sensitive over those issues, don't we? Can't we? We can get like super thin-skinned on those issues that, that, you know, we should probably allow ourselves to have grace and mercy. I remember I was sitting in, in um, I was up over at Hawaiian Mission Academy, and I'm just kind of sitting in their lobby and hanging out with the students. And at the same time, there were some student missionaries that had come over and they were receiving training uh, over there. <laughs> and, and it was nice. We were having a good old time. And the guy that I was sitting next to was very passionate. Like, oh, man, he was super passionate. He had gone through the school of evangelism, and he was just, like, super passionate. He says, let me loose. I'm ready to go. And I was just like hanging out with him, just talking, and saying, "Yeah, that's great. You know, I'm so glad that you're enthusiastic." So, and I happened to know that it was part of the Bachelor School of Evangelism, and so I just wanted to poke fun at him, you know, because I've met Doug before, and, and we've talked and we shared and, and what have you. And I was just, I was just noticing that he was like super enthusiastic, and I probably shouldn't have done it, but I just wanted, wanted to poke a little fun. And I said, "You know what? I'm so excited about how enthusiastic you are." However, you know, I just got one, one concern. He goes, what's that? He was like really intense, like breathing hard. And I said, <laughs> I said, well, you know what? What you have is wonderful, but I don't know about that Doug Bachelor guy. And, and he's like, he responds like almost immediately, Doug Bachelor, straight as an arrow. And I was just like, oh, easy, easy. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and it was just, you know, it was just a sign that, his sensitivity was so on his sleeve, and and, and um, I probably shouldn't have done that, but <laughs> but but it does speak to the point where sometimes our sensitivities cause breakdown in relationships. There are five signs of arguing. This is from Marriage and Family Therapy out in New York. I thought it was just nice. These are the five signs that your argument means that you, your relationship is starting to fall apart. Number one, arguments never lead to resolution. Number two, your, argue, your arguments end with one of you stonewalling. You know what that means is that, is that you're unwilling to talk with them anymore. Number three, your arguments regularly include name calling or excessive cursing. And I'm gonna let you know, we don't curse necessarily um, because we don't take the Lord's name in vain, but even Adventists do amount of cursing. Okay? We, we speak unkindly in hopes that it will dig deeply into their soul and hurt them. You know, we do that. Well, I don't know. I mean, it, it, right now, I wouldn't want to say it. <laughs> uh, number four. Number four. Arguments leave you feeling disconnected from one another. And number five. Arguments are what you remember when you think of your relationship. That's when the arguments start to become very uh, in, impassable. But with the Lord, there's amazing, there's the amazing ability to redirect our attention. Remember, we can always start to preach in the name of the Lord. We can come back to that. We can lead to grace. We can uplift Jesus. We can develop inclusivity. We can do those things. And that would eliminate disputing, or at least a lot faster. Unfortunately, sometimes it becomes necessary to separate for the dust to settle within a conflict. For, two, for the murky waters to become clear, uh, so that you're able to clearly see what God is intending for the growth of his church. And it came to the point where Saul was needing to move. I mean, he, he had to leave quickly. In Acts chapter 22, it says that he was in the, the sanctuary and he was praying and the Lord had given him a vision that he needed to leave quickly because they were intending to kill him. And so he went to the brothers. And I love the fact that he called them brothers. 
Because something happened in 15 days when he first arrives at Jerusalem as a result of the interaction that Barnabas had taken him and his ability to preach the name of the Lord, somehow he developed family in the Jerusalem church. And he called them brothers. But he needed to leave. The Lord told him, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. Now, I, as I was doing some study on, on how long Saul was out, out of the way, he was out in Tarsus. Some say that Saul was in Tarsus for up to 10 years. 10 years. Now, here's some perspective for you. I've served as a pastor for this congregation for five years. Saul was in Tarsus waiting for the opportunity to serve the Lord for 10. Waiting for the Lord to put him in the game. What was he doing? I, you know, most leaders, I'm going to let you know, most leaders that truly serve uh, um, major growing time for the Lord in the, in the church. Most leaders who serve the Lord and they're transitional, or not transitional, they're, they're transformational leaders. Many of them go through the wilderness time. Many of them do. Remember uh, Moses? When he left Egypt, he spent 40 years guarding somebody else's sheep. David, the youngest of the, of, of the sons of Jesse, Samuel comes and says, don't you have another kid? Jesse says, oh yeah, that's just David though, you know, you don't want him. And he's a young boy, comes in and he gets anointed to be king. But how long was it before he was? Desert time. Jesus himself was in the desert 40 days and 40 nights. Saul, 10 years in Tarsus, preparing for what the Lord could do with him. I wondered that maybe it's God's intention to give desert wilderness time to those leaders so that they will learn how to be more dependent on him. Because notice this in Philippians chapter 2. This is Saul, or Paul at this time. Paul writing what he has learned as a result of having some alone time with the Lord. Philippians chapter 2, he's writing to the church that he had, he had ministered to in Philippians. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work his good pleasure. Now Saul, before this, when he's arguing with the Hellenists, he wants to cram, you know, Christianity down the throat of those Hellenists until they were able to gag on it and say, you will become a Christian. He wants to, you know, force feed them his belief system. But here, after this wilderness time, he's now including, he says, hey, listen, it's all about what God is able to do. It's all God doing everything. God's the one who's going to cause to will. God's the one who's going to cause somebody to have a transformation of their actions. God's the one who's doing it all. I'm just a support system to him. That's it. And that's what he had to learn. Notice this. Do all things without grumbling or what? Do you think he learned a lesson about the student? I think he I think that he learned this lesson as he continues. He says that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a perfect and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. That's what happens when you allow God to start redirecting your enthusiasm to be supportive of his ability. Amen. Amen. 
So where does this play out? How does this work with us? Because I can leave it unsolved and we can walk out of here without application. But I'm going to give you a prayerful application that I've been wrestling with on behalf of the Thousand Oaks Church. I believe the church sometimes goes through down times so that they can relearn their dependence on Christ. Now just work with that just for a moment. Because as we consider where we have been as a church, is it not true that we've had some downtime? I would like to suggest that we start to learn about what God wants to do. That we start to learn about what his vision is, what might be possible with him just simply showing us and telling us what to do. What it might look like. That starts to get me a little excited. Because while Saul was in Tarsus having his downtime, this is what God did in the church. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. The church had peace and they were being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Now, just to, just to kind of get our head around what multiplied means, um, I have played the stock market a little bit. Yes, I am on Robin Hood. I've got that app on my phone. I was shown how to use it. And I've been paying attention to cryptocurrency. And mind you, I'm letting you know I'm not advocating for any one. But I'm just sharing what has happened in my view. Because you have to understand, I'm interested in multiplication and not addition. Is that correct? Aren't you? When you're, when you're looking at the markets and of you know, for financial uh, possibility. So I bought Dogecoin, thinking to myself that if I had only just a handful of Dogecoin, that they might look like Bitcoin eventually, that they might be considered equal to Bitcoin. And you know what that would mean? Right now, one Bitcoin is valued at $65,000 for one. To the point where there was a guy that had a Bitcoin. Get this. A guy had a Bitcoin and he didn't have any cash and he bought a pizza with a Bitcoin some years ago. Are you kidding me? You know what that guy is thinking to himself? That pizza just cost me $65,000. And it probably gave him heartburn. <laughs> but I'm looking at this Dogecoin as a possibility. Could it be that my handful of Dogecoins will be like Bitcoin? Wouldn't that be multiplication? Wouldn't I be really appreciative of that? And by the way, we would all be appreciative that because you know I tied so so you know it, that would be wonderful I, I I lay up this promise I will tie it on whatever benefits I get from Dogecoin I promise you right now it's about a dollar so but, but I think the Lord wants multiplication for those who are coming to the Lord don't you and I think that investment into whatever the Lord wants will cause uh, a, a more enthusiasm and excitement for that to be a reality here at Thousand Oaks. And it comes down to this. These two things were what happened in the church during this multiplication time frame. Fear of the Lord, in other words, knowing why you need a Savior, 
and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Those two things were happening in the church. The comfort of the Holy Spirit, I know this is small, but I'm just going to read it to you because I think, I think it speaks to God's connection with us, his passionate connection to us. It is an intimate call that someone personally gives to deliver God's verdict. God's verdict is, you belong to me. Oh, what manner of love the Father has given to us. You are his children. You belong to him. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the comfort of the Holy Spirit. But I don't, I don't deserve it. That's correct. You don't. You still are his children. If we become a church, that is inclusive, and we become Barnabas, and we simply strive to preach in the name of the Lord, and we recognize even when distances have to happen, that brotherhood remains strong. God will multiply this church as he, as he comes and comforts us in the Holy Spirit. I believe that's what God wants. So I'm going to invite our praise team to come forward and share in this last song. But don't you want that? I mean, seriously, let's just let's just be for real. No more just sitting in a church, no more just sitting on a pew. Let's just let's just be serious just for a moment and say, hey, don't we want that? I want that. Um, it takes beyond Saturday to make that happen. It takes how you talk to people at on Facebook. It takes how you talk to your neighbors and just give invitations. It might even mean that it takes you going and picking them up. It takes Opportunities to be kind to people as you're just waiting in line at Del Taco. It takes those kinds of engages in the Lord to add to our numbers, multiply, and to the Lord.